Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 272, I chat with journalist and reviewer Robert Heron about home theater PCs. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded September 10th, 2015, episode 272, all about home theater PCs. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Corning Optical Cables. Corning's incredibly durable Thunderbolt and USB 3-point optical cables are longer, thinner, lighter, and stronger. Go to corning.com slash twit and use the promo code twit to save up to $50 on USB 3-point optical cables. And by ProXPN. ProXPN is a virtual private network that allows you to use the internet the way it should be, anonymously and without oversight. Save 50% off a 12-month subscription. Go to proxpn.com slash twit and use the code HTG50 at checkout. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the home theater geek and editor of avsforum.com. This week, I'm happy to bring Robert Heron back uh, for part two of our conversation uh, this week about home theater PCs. Hey, Robert, welcome back. Hey, thank you so much, Scott. It's always a pleasure to be here. Always a pleasure for me to have you here. You're one of my favorite guests on the show, and not just me, but many, many uh, of the audience members uh, also uh, really enjoy it when you're on the show. And so I'm so glad you're back uh, because we started talking last week and we just kind of, kind of, you know, got on to a bunch of interesting stuff and didn't get to the one topic that I wanted to cover with you, which is home theater PCs. So this week we're going to spend uh, the whole time talking about that. And there's plenty to talk about, isn't there? <laughs> you aren't kidding. And things are changing up too with introductions of technologies like 4k UHD and 3D audio formats and things like that, and how you would deal with really high-end playback in a home theater PC environment as well. So those are Excellent. some of the things I'm just starting to get into, and I'd love to talk about that. Yeah, well, I would too, especially since uh, home theater PCs are probably one of the areas I know least about in this realm uh, compared to speakers and TVs and other stuff like that. So I'm really interested in learning more about it from you as well. Before we get started, though, I want to make sure that those who are tuned in live at live.twit.tv or logged into the chat room there or at irc.twit.tv, you can post questions for us as we go and I will pass along as many as I can. I think, Robert, uh, you and I are both monitoring the chat room. And so uh, if you put our screen name in the message that you type, then it will show up in a different color and it'll be easier for us to spot. My screen name is Scott Wilkinson, my whole name without any dots or dashes. Robert's is Robert Heron with an underscore between the first and the last name. So uh, try and put that in there and uh, we should be able to ferret those out pretty easily. I get a nice audio cue as well for oh, when somebody you? types in a name. Yeah, it gets a little chirp. So oh, like, okay. Oh, I, then I glance over. So. Oh, okay. All right. Cool. Multitasking away here. Multitasking away. You and me both, man. Okay. So we're talking about home theater PCs or HTPCs as they're commonly called. Um, let's start by defining exactly what that is and what components are required uh, to, to call. I mean, you could just go out and buy a PC, but home theater PCs are, are somewhat specialized. And so I imagine they need kind of specialized components either inside them as cards or maybe out external boxes connected by USB or whatever. Um, give us a kind of a low down overview of what we're talking about here. Well, it's pretty much any computing hardware that allows you to enjoy the content. Maybe you would experience uh, streaming on a computer or playing back on a computer, but in a home theater environment rather than a smaller screen like your computer monitor or even a mobile device. Uh, the hardware itself is fairly agnostic uh, in terms of just it could be anything from an unused smartphone of relatively recent generations all the way up to dedicated full-blown tower systems to custom-built, purpose-driven 
computers that you specifically leave as clean as possible so they function over the long term to be very reliable, either a DVR or a tuner that provides content uh, recording capabilities as well as playback capabilities for one person or multiple users within a household. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it is a variety. It's more like a, a build it the way you need it type of, of technology. And it, it is it is a great way to not only save money, but if you're already familiar with building computers or or, or just software and installing and things like that, it's 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 a ni nice way to to just you know bring it all together and have it have it exactly the way you want. At often, if you if you look at the cost over time, it can be a good way to save money too. Mm. Over things like Blu-ray players and set top boxes and that sort of thing. I'm thinking specifically for people who have really expensive cable TV bills in particular. That's ah. that's where you can save a lot. That's where I got started doing it. It's eventually, I got tired of just paying outrageous amounts of money a month for, for my live TV. And then I started exploring what my favorite content was and alternative ways of getting it. And then building hardware. And and initially when I started, actually, it was about how can I get rid of my set, my DVR that I'm renting from the cable company? And I mm. started with that thought and said, is there hardware available today that will allow me to build a box that duplicates the functionality and provides it in something that I, I'm not having to, you know, struggle to maintain. It, it should just work like uh, like any good appliance would without a lot of hassle. So mm. that that's well, where I got my toe dipped in the water regarding home theater PCs. But it, it just kept rolling from there. The more I got into the whole cord cutter movement and just finding alternative ways of using the internet uh, to find the content I like, be it live mm -hmm. or you know, streamed. Well, that's one question I have is live TV. You mentioned that, and that's, that is important for many people, especially things like big sporting events or, uh, you know, big, uh, news events. Uh, and, and I'm wondering, of course you can get an over the air tuner, which is how many people cut the cord, so to speak, to cable and satellite, but that only gives you the local channel, the channels that are broadcasting terrestrially in your geographical area. Um, can you also get live TV easily from, you know, the networks and other places uh, on the Internet? I, I always thought that was more like a kind of a podcast situation where you, you go and stream it, but it's past when it actually showed live on TV. I have found that most major broadcasters, your ABC, CBS, CW, Fox, NBC, PBS, they all provide some level of free live TV on their websites. So as long as you have a good broadband connection, there are there will always be options available in terms of being able to find actual live content, not not delayed or anything like that. And and with a decent internet connection, you can take advantage of that stuff for little to no cost. And often you don't even it, a lot of times certain content or certain websites will require a sign in using credentials from say a cable or satellite TV provider. In those cases, you know, that 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 is not as ideal, especially if you are trying to just lose the whole subscription bill entirely. And in that case, there, there are other new up and coming services as well, like Sling TV, uh, mm -hmm. which has just given you starting at 20 bucks a month, no contract, a handful of stations uh, with with content with options to add in packages for other other types of content that you may be interested in receiving, be it sports programming or whatever. And the more you look around, the more I find that more companies are, are just uh, embracing this and providing their, their services online. You know, you're not necessarily getting rid of all commercials or anything like that. And that's part of the part of the way they do it is they they do stream the commercials as well as the content. But mm -hmm. I'm finding there with things like sports programming in particular, uh, ESPN Go, although live programming will require a subscription login. Oftentimes, most of their games that they show uh, uh, from a variety of different sports can be pre-watched afterwards, after it's already broadcast. So if you're if you're not into the live thing, you can really save a lot of money by just checking out what websites actually offer. Um, mm -hmm. Beyond that, services like Sling TV are are a good alternative. In addition to the, the the major players out there like Netflix and Amazon Instant Video and Hulu, uh, more more ways of watching content. Maybe not real time, but uh, very close, like same day uh, in mm. certain cases for, for your favorite TV shows. Well, certainly HBO uh, recently, as we know, went from HBO Go, which meant which you had to have a cable subscription to access it, to HBO Now, where you don't. So, so even they have seen sort of the writing on the wall, handwriting on the wall, so to speak. 
that uh, that this is really the wave of the future, and I think more people are doing it. Also, didn't I just see an, a news item like a day or two ago uh, that Hulu was going to drop commercials? This is one of the things that bugs me about Hulu Plus, which is really the one you want, is that you pay eight bucks a month, and you you have access to all these TV shows that you might want to see, but there's still commercials in them. What? That is really the biggest uh, incentive for me to look for the content the way I want to watch it. I subscribe to MLB TV, even though I do have access to certain cable channels, in, in addition to some over the air as well. MLB TV doesn't actually show any of the commercials during baseball games, and I absolutely love that feature. And in addition, I can also select different audio sources. Uh, do I want to listen to the local radio broadcast while I'm watching the national video feed? Or do I want to hear just ambient park sound and things like that? And mm. that to me is, is one of the areas where there is a company that's really showing how to do it right. And they recently, uh, the MLB TV group, recently expanded their, that similar functionality and, and interface to NHL. So if you're a hockey fan, you, had, you now have one of the very best services available in terms of being able to get away from a, a, a costly subscription, be it satellite or cable. And as long as you have that decent internet performance or, or cellular, if you, can, if you have a great data plan, uh, to be able to stream that content anywhere you want and how you want in HD mm -hmm. quality. Uh, and it's it's really it's really a game changer. Yeah, yeah. You also mentioned uh, replacing your uh, rented DVR from the cable company or the satellite company uh, with an HTPC, and that would seem to me to be that would be an argument for having a dedicated home theater PC that's only used for that because you're going to fill up a hard disk pretty quick, even a big one. You know, with At HD content, certainly. And if you have also on that same hard disk, you know, your photos and your music, well, your music maybe maybe is a reasonable thing to put on there. But but other things that aren't related to home theater PC, couldn't that kind of muck things up a bit? Not necessarily. I mean, storage is relatively cheap. And one of, the beauties, uh, one of the beauties, though, of having that dedicated box, and in this case, I, I built a home theater PC that sat in the living room in a nice custom case. Uh, to only two terabytes of storage, but generally speaking, that is far more storage than you'll get with any of the provided DVR boxes from any provider. Some of the newest, latest generation DVRs I'm finding have more storage, but that ability, especially in a large household, to have multiple tuners, uh, enough to support everyone recording their favorite shows, yet still being able to play back something you want to watch that might be recorded as well. I, I, I can't tell you how many times I go into somebody's house and they have a DVR that looks relatively new, but then you find out, oh, it's only dual tuner and there is so little space left on the hard drive that we're constantly having to delete something or, oh, there's two shows being recorded, so we can't change the channel. Those mm -hmm. kind of things were just my biggest pet peeves, and that drove me to say there must be a better way to do it. And there are some great companies out there that make this hardware that go that pairs with a home theater PC, uh, be it in an external or an internal format, and companies like uh, – Silicon Dust and Seton Corp. They both make terrific tuner hardware that allow you to either use cable card technology, which, you know, I don't know how much longer cable cards will be around, but they still are around. And renting a cable card is is orders of magnitude cheaper than renting a cable box. Although you're mm -hmm. going to have the initial investment of building a home theater PC to begin with. Uh, but mm -hmm. if, but if, you, if you're paying like $15 or more or more a month for, for a DVR, uh, Think about that cost over a year or two and then factor that into what you can build and and especially if you're going to use it for a few years. And that helps that helps justify if you need that justification, at least uh, <laughs> why to do it or how to do it. But uh, I started with a Seton tuner, a uh, cable card tuner. And the first one I picked up was when I think it was their original generation product. And it was a quad tuner cable card. Uh, which I thought was the be all end all of everything. And then later on, they came out with a version that would support up to six, six simultaneous recordings with one multi-stream cable card. And that was an internal hardware product where it actually was a PCI express card that, that slipped into the home theater PC. They later went on to create an ethernet based one that connected to a network. And the folks over at Silicon dust, they specialize wholeheartedly in network enabled tuners, be it over the air or, with uh, or with uh, or cable card related as well, and mm -hmm. and really once it's set up, I found uh, it, it more depends on what it is you're trying to record. Will depend on your software choices. So 
when I built my home theater PC, I needed cable card support. And it turned out at the time, the only platform that allowed you to do uh, encrypted, say, programming, uh, stuff that needed to be decoded by the cable card in order to be uh, saved or played back later, it required Windows Media Center. So I ended up using that as the main platform. It also, Windows Media Center provided a free channel guide, which was important to be able to schedule out recordings ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And and it provided a beautiful HD interface, uh, which made, you know, the channel guide and finding my shows and everything else uh, work perfectly. And it also tied in with some other software I ended up adding in to do things like streaming my own movies that I have archived on a NAS device right into the living room at full quality, uh, including lossless multi-channel sound and all, that, all the other goodies that go along with it. So mm -hmm. it, it started with that. And then eventually once I got rid of a subscription cable service altogether – I just simply switched up the tuners to be the over-the-air variety. And I've, I've used everything from in-the-box to a USB stick style tuner to currently I'm using uh, Silicon Dust makes beautiful uh, dual tuners that uh, sit on your network. And you can access them from a variety of, of different, anything, pretty much anything on the network can access those devices. So mm, mm. Makes it makes it easy. So uh, the silicon, we have actually some graphics. Some so we, we wanted to show the websites of Silicon Dust and uh, Seton in particular, C-E-T-O-N, uh, which are two very important companies in this whole space. Um, That's here's the card right there that I have in my home theater PC right now. And I'm about to fire it back up again as a as a cable card tuner uh, because I have a friend. You went back to cable card? Well, I've, I'm in a household right now that actually has cable service, and they're just tired of paying the bills for, for you know, not only renting that box, but also its limited capabilities. So, uh, right. and I said, you know what? I have a perfectly good cable card tuner, six six tuners in one cable card. Uh, that's And plus, the I have two terabytes of storage with an SSD boot drive in it. And it is fantastic in terms of just its use and functionality. And even though Windows Media Center currently is uh, basically gone with Windows 10, yes. it is going to be supported through Windows 7 and 8 well past 2020. Well, the year 2020 for Windows 7 and a couple of years beyond that for Windows 8. And, and if you still have Windows 7, it is still, in my opinion, one of the one of the only options you have for, for cable card tuning. If you're talking just over the air reception or any other media formats, you, you definitely don't need to stick with Windows. You can, you can, there are plenty of Linux options, uh, OS 10 options, uh, a variety of different software packages out there that you can, you can dodge the bullet, so to speak. With, uh, <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're just not into using Microsoft or Windows Media right. Center. So, right. But what about the electronic program guide? You said that the Windows Media Center was one reason you like to use it, aside from the cable card part was that it gave you an electronic program guide that let you schedule recordings based upon the name and when they were, rather than having to search and type in a bunch of stuff. Uh, where does that come from now? Yeah, uh, that and it was free. That was the big and deal for me. Free. Yeah. So I, I've looked at a lot of other uh, uh, products that, like Tableau has a great DVR product that's pur purposely made to do two or four tuners, and stream all that content over a network to either a mobile device or a TV with an app or something like that. However, they charge you a monthly fee for that channel guide information and for just their curation of a beautiful interface. And it's it was affordable, but at the same point, it's like I'm really that whole concept of paying once for something and then just having it is really what drove me to, it keeps me excited. I'd, I'd rather just get the payments out of the way and own it outright. Same mm -hmm. with like having like lifetime service on a TiVo. Uh, it's like, you know what, I'll pay once and I don't ever want to think about it again, just for the life right. of this product. Uh, it, it just works. So recently, apparently, uh, Microsoft has changed up where they're getting their guide data from for windows media center. And some people are not so happy with it. Uh, mm. it, it my, that I'm going to be curious to see how it has changed because it, it used to work pretty damn well. And I, I'll be bummed if it, if it, if the way they've changed it has uh, interrupted the flow at all. But there's a company called Rovi, and they provide guide data uh, at, at reasonable cost for products, say, like uh, Channel Master's DVR Plus, uh, uh, one of my favorite dual tuners for somebody that's looking for an over-the-air DVR. You can add your own storage or get it pre-loaded with it um, and connect your antenna, and it gives you a terrific interface with some streaming options like Pandora and Netflix and other things. Uh, but in the as far as the the capabilities of the box go, it is it is fantastic, and I I just think that 
I never had any issues using Rovi guide data on their product. And that was also a buy once and use forever without any further billing uh, ways to go. So that, that's still probably my favorite standalone DVR. If you don't want to build something and you just need it for over the air tuning only for local channels, uh, that's a fantastic product. Uh, Channel Masters Rovi. DVR Plus. Oh, oh yeah. sorry. Channel Master. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They're the antenna people, which they're, they're a fun company, by the way. I just uh, oh, are everyone they? I ever deal with over there just seems really cool and and they That's know they cool. have a pretty good product with DVR plus so yeah um <clears throat> so just to uh, wrap up the whole hardware part uh so we've talked about tuners over the air cable card um storage you want as much as possible but even with 2 terabytes you've got 2 terabytes which I can't believe I'm saying this you know it doesn't sound like all that much these days <laughs> No, but it's uh, but, a couple of seasons of shows or or full seasons of your favorite shows, like a handful of shows. It's like I found that I didn't bother erasing anything. I would just let yeah. it all record. And you know what? Maybe toward the end of the season, it has to erase the, some of the first stuff because it's just filling up. But otherwise, yeah, storage isn't so much of a concern when you can do your own DVR. And mm -hmm. and that's a really nice way to go. Uh, yeah. Somebody was just calling me. I had to hang up oh. on them. Oh, <laughs> excuse well, thank, me. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, I'll tell you well, what, one of the you, other issues I ran into, though. Oh, no, it, it's, it's all done. But uh, one okay. of the other <laughs> issues I ran into, though, building your own DVR, it was software costs. Uh, that turned out to be one of the big expenses. Like if you want Blu-ray playback on your home theater PC and and uh, those packages can cost 100 bucks or, or, you know, 70 to 100 dollars for, for just doing Blu-ray playback. And, and you start adding up that or... I use another program for managing my uh, my movie collection that I have archived. That was like another hundred bucks. Uh, but still, and then these are like one time payments and I really don't have to bother with it again. But those are the things that can add up quickly, especially if you're starting from scratch. Um, yeah. You, you know, uh, OS cost if need be. Uh, but, you know, it, it's part of the investment at least. And honestly, if I looking back now, I probably wouldn't even have a Blu-ray drive in, in my home theater PC. I'd probably just stick with a standalone player if I really needed one. Or like I said, too, I, I have some of my favorite content actually just archived to a hard drive. So into a NAS well, that's, system that's that streams it anywhere. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that, of course, brings up its whole the whole other subject of, you know, ripping Blu-rays and DVDs onto your NAS network attached storage. For those who don't know, uh, you know, is technically illegal, uh, but everybody does it. And I guess it so, is illegal. <laughs> I'm afraid so. Uh, uh, and you remember the Kaleidoscape? Is. You remember the Kaleidoscape uh, lawsuit? Uh, they were sued over their uh, ripping DVDs to their server, and they agreed. They made an agreement now that you can rip Blu-rays to their server as long as you have the Blu-ray physical disc itself in the system somewhere, um, yeah. which which assures that you actually own it. Uh, so. You know, I this is this is a bit of a concern uh, for some people more than others, uh, but everybody does it, and, and I think it's it's worthwhile doing and should be allowed because you own that copy of the content. You should be able to make a copy of it and put it on a NAS drive. I totally agree, and the thing really is that streaming has really taken over a lot of my old arch where I would archive everything, uh, but now I find that if that movie is available on streaming. If it's if it has a five one soundtrack, it may not be you know a, a Dolby True HD or DTS HD Master Audio, but it's good enough. Then I'm mm -hmm. okay with it. But but there are there are plenty of movies out there where I'm like you know I own that Blu-ray. It is in lossless audio, and I'm yes. going to enjoy it in, in high bit rate 1080p and yep. and take advantage of that. And I, I hate looking for discs. I'd much rather go to a beautiful Kaleidoscape style interface, which. Good golly, if you've ever messed with one of their systems, they just work. And and yeah, it's a hassle now with the the way the the ruling worked in that you have to still have like a 300 plus disc changer or multiple ones with mm -hmm. all of your discs present. But and then it can also, it's still pulling it off a hard drive to stream it to you, but it has to check to see the disc is actually there. Yep, It's annoying. It really kind of put the, put a, uh, I don't know, a little sand in their gears, but. <laughs> they offer a quality. They offer a quality product that, if you've got the money and you want to make that investment, you will not be disappointed. Uh, for both for both monitoring what your kids are watching to just having all of your content available at the push of a button, uh, it's it's really a fantastic way to go for the quality 
uh, yeah. aspect of it. Um, they also that's, that's really a, what it is. They also now have a, a store, basically an online store, where you can buy the content in uncompressed, same as Blu-ray, perfectly bit for bit the same quality without having to have the disc in the drive. You'd have to buy it from their store, but uh, it, it does kind of streamline that, a little, streamline that a little bit. Well, you know what? You we've got a number. Sorry, oh, go, go ahead. ahead. I was going to say, you oh, mentioned was... storage, though, and we've, we've talked a lot about NAS devices. And one of the cool things going back to the home theater PC part of it is that, you know what? I, maybe you don't want to, maybe you have network enabled tuners and you don't want to have a PC running 24-7, uh, but you have a NAS product in your home for, for your own personal backup. And those boxes are specifically made to store tons of data already. Is there a way then you could then directly transfer your recorded programming right to that NAS box and then retrieve it back and forth? And the folks over at Silicon Dust start, did a Kickstarter over the summer called the HD Home Run DVR. And I had a link to that if you wanted to pull that page up real quick. But this is one of the, the, the things that really has me excited going forward is like most of these DVR products, the higher end ones at least, have good compute capabilities. Uh, and some run good Intel processors in them in order to make sure they run quick. And they can take, they can leverage that and the app environment that a lot of NAS devices have now and say, hey, what if we just put a DVR app on the NAS device so you can configure what the tuner, where the tuners save, how they save it, qualities and all that. And then just stream like over DLNA or to an app on a mobile device or whatever and have the individual TVs be able to access that and or whatever display device you're going to be looking at it on. And I, I think that's really one of the areas where I'll go next is just to avoid yet another box in the house altogether and simply take a take a NAS that's compatible with the right app and the right software and have it be the main storage unit. Because then you have you have backup in the sense of the redundancy of a NAS, its very nature. But then also it's just, it's a box of hard drives and you, you'll need that to record and store <laughs> all your personal data anyway. And if it gets a few more people to back up their data in terms of their personal files and things like that, <laughs> uh, even, even though it is in the home, you should have offsite backups, but still, uh, I that, think that's, that's, a, one, that's, a, that's a clever yeah. way to go. Yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent. Well, we got a lot more to talk about. We got a number of questions in the chat room that we'll get to. Uh, but for the moment, I would like to thank one of our sponsors for this episode. Uh, which is Corning Optical Cables. Now, most of us know the name Corning. Uh, and what's important here is that they've transformed the traditional USB and Thunderbolt cables from plain old copper into incredibly durable fiber optic speed demons. Whether you're into high-end audio, video or photography, audio production or computing, you really want the best, most reliable cables out there, don't you? I sure do. So it's important to take a look at Corning's Thunderbolt and USB three-point optical cables. That's the name of them. Corning is known for fiber optics, and when you think of fiber, you probably think of glass. And glass breaks, right? Yet Corning has figured out a way how to make their USB and Thunderbolt cables super strong and flexible. So flexible, you can bend them, walk on them, even tie them in a knot, and they keep transmitting at top speed. And speaking of speed, Corning fiber optic cables provide incredible data rates of up to 20 gigabits per second for Thunderbolt and 5 gigabits per second for USB 3. No other cable even comes close. Corning optical cables have exceptional cable runs of up to 60 meters, that's 200 feet, for Thunderbolt and 50 meters, or 165 feet, for USB 3. Now you can declutter, move peripherals into another room, very important for what we're talking about today, uh, improve productivity and increase security by putting expensive gear out of the way. Corning optical cables are longer, thinner, lighter, and stronger. In fact, they, they're 50% they're thinner and 80% lighter than traditional copper cables. Take advantage of this special deal for Twit viewers from Corning. Get $30 off the 30 meter and $50 off 50 meter USB three point optical cables. And there's no limit. You can buy as many as you want. Go to corning.com slash twit and use the offer code twit at checkout. And we thank Corning very much for their support of home theater geeks. So let's take a couple of um, chat room questions, shall we? Oh yes. Oh, yeah. It is a, it is a hive, of act, hive of activity in there. It is, isn't it? It's pretty amazing. Um, one of them was, um, 
wanting to know just sort of what your hardware and software configuration is that the box you have in your room that you use. Uh, currently, it's what's on my website. Uh, that that oh, okay. same box that I built, um, I think three, four, five years ago now is is still it's a it's a Sandy Bridge based Intel PC. Uh, I forget how big the SSD boot drive is. Not very big, just enough to hold the OS and the software and and basic mm -hmm. stuff like that, but then a two terabyte standard hard drive, compact, and I found a box that was done in very nice brushed aluminum that's held up beautifully over the years, and it, it doesn't look so much like a PC, and I can still control it with something like a Harmony remote. It's got built-in IR support, um, and, and that has served me well, and now my thoughts are turning toward, you know, do I go with a network-style product and if I'm using all network tuners, do I then save it to a NAS device or something like that? I'm looking at everything from the latest generation of, well, somebody mentioned a Raspberry Pi. That might be one way to go. I'm also looking at the uh, the small boxes from Intel, their, their next unit of computing, uh, the Nooks. And they just had new hardware come out recently or a refresh with the new chipsets that Intel just released. And their latest hardware I'm looking at, Skylake in particular, I'm looking at specifically for one, the graphic performance. I really, my next project is going to be something to see. Is is 4K really doable right now? Uh, mm -hmm. Be it upscaled, upscaled or native content? Is it is it supported on a PC platform? Also, what about 3D audio formats? I mean, you can do lossless audio today with a player, with most of the Blu-ray player software on computers if you set it up right. Uh, that's there. Uh, and it sounds awesome. It sounds like it should. Uh, but I haven't heard anything yet about 3D audio format support. And you know what? Maybe maybe there's just not enough of a market for them to actually add these features to to software. Well, maybe not. Uh, maybe not on, yet. On and by the by the way, for 3D audio, we're talking about uh, Dolby Atmos, uh, Oro, DTSX, those audio formats that put sound in speakers or virtual speakers overhead to give you that true three dimensional uh, sound field. Uh, right now, there there is nothing in the home theater PC world that will do that? Uh, not to my knowledge yet, but I, I'm just starting to scratch the surface what the audio capabilities are. I mean, the, mm -hmm. I'll be honest, the, the, the playback software selection has also decreased dramatically on the Windows side of things. Uh, really? I think we're down to like one app now. Power DVD, I think, is the only one left. Uh, everyone else kind of stepped out of the whole market. I guess there just wasn't enough money to be made or something uh, for people buying playback software on their computers. So mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a bummer, but... You know, yeah, we'll, we'll see. yeah. Well, SoundPro69 uh, is asking, what Linux option would you recommend? That is as varied as you want. I mean, it depends more on the platform you're probably most comfortable using, uh, be it a Plex style setup or a Kodi style setup. Uh, they're available on a variety of different operating systems. So, and and if you've got the hardware for it, uh, you know, why not make it as bulletproof as possible? Maybe maybe a, uh, a flash boot scenario or something very, very, very clean in terms of just getting into the app, very purpose built. Uh, and it also keeps your cost down, too, if you can find all the right codecs and other tools as well. That's, you know, especially with over the air tuning in particular, you could pretty much do all the software for free or very low cost or what comes with the tuner hardware itself. So that's always going to be, I think, your, your best cost-effective option, particularly with over-the-air tuning. With cable cards, you need some specific software support that only certain OSs and platforms have currently. Which that, is, as far which is as really I know. only Windows, right? Yeah, as far as I know. And I would love somebody to say, hey, well, you know what? Here on this package now, we can do it with you know this or whatever. So that's why I'm hoping also with the, the Kickstarter for the Silicon Dust folks with their HD Home Run DVR that I'll be able to take my, I have a three tuner uh, network cable card adapter from them that I absolutely love and it works just dandy. And if I can, if I can repurpose that into, into NAS based storage with the app controlling everything there, uh, channel guide information being provided, uh, that kind of gets me out of windows altogether too. And I'm not sure, I guess that wouldn't be Linux. It might be Linux on the NAS. You could think of it that way, but it'd be more about just having Having it as simplified as possible with gear I already own. Uh, mm -hmm. I was really, uh, I'm looking at probably for my next NAS product, something from the Synology folks. Uh, because they they provide not only good hardware, uh, but also fast CPU power uh, for, for app performance. And you can run a variety of different apps on their hardware already. I'll be curious to see what what NAS platforms that the Silicon Dust project for the HD Home Run DVR will will support 
Because currently it won't be able to do it with any NAS as far as I know. It's going to have to be specifically supported NAS products. So, But it, it all goes back right. to, to needing, needing storage anyway. And why not take advantage of something that that is one of those boxes that's probably running 24-7 or should be in every house. I think every home should have their own NAS. But mm -hmm. uh, network attached storage is the best uh, in terms of just keeping your files a little safer uh, and, and having something there that you can hopefully turn into like a multi-purpose product. Uh, yeah. Another yeah. another aspect of that that Synology product in particular that has me kind of interested as well is security cameras. They have IP camera support, so that's going off topic, but uh, it's just another one of those uses of of a product that you may already own that you may not have been aware of. And in addition to, of course, home theater PCs. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Beatmaster in the chat room is asking, how does the UI user interface experience vary from a regular tuner setup to an HTPC? Is the HTPC as remote friendly, meaning no need for a keyboard or mouse? It depends. You know, it, sometimes on these online places, you want to search for something. I sure as heck prefer a keyboard over, you know, moving the cursor to each letter. That takes forever. I I stick with a keyboard, a nice Logitech Harmony keyboard that's specific for, it seems perfect for a home theater PC. And it ties into my PlayStation as well over Bluetooth, which I really love. But mm -hmm. uh, I think control wise interface wise that's probably one of the best reasons to get away from the hardware that your your service provider is giving you especially at least here in California with and I, I we have Comcast cable in the in the neighborhood I'm in their most of their DVR boxes that you'll find in most homes are using a four by three ugly standard definition channel guide and it mm. looks it looks horrible and sure if you have the latest and greatest hardware, from Comcast, their X1 platform in particular, which it is awesome. I just set one of those up for a for a family member, and that looks fantastic. It's all HD. It looks really good. Uh, it's got voice support for being able to say what you want to watch and things like that. But mm -hmm. for for the majority of Comcast subscribers with HD programming coming into their homes, they're going to this crap looking four by three old school SD interface, and that's one advantage that just about every uh, media center app I've seen is the first to stress. They all talk about a 10 foot viewing experience where it, the interface looks great and it's very easy to navigate visually, uh, on a big screen environment. And, and it takes advantage of high resolution displays like your 1080p and 4k TVs, uh, to, to give you even better quality as far as just being able to see data, figure out what you want to watch and then navigate right to it or set it up for a recording down the road. So uh, I, I think that's one of the better reasons to build your own as well. You will end up with a better looking interface. It also very customizable too. Uh, mm. Most of the packages out there, be it Kodi or Plex or whatever, they allow you to fully customize that interface. So if you want to have a, you know, the background be a picture of your kid or your or a sunset or whatever, uh, you know, you can do that. And uh, and in addition, enjoy a, a wider variety of content. I find mm. now if you're dealing with 4K streaming in particular, that's one of the little edge cases, little, that's one of the edge cases currently where you're, you're still kind of stuck with some proprietary hardware. For, for most of the new 4K TVs, it's going to be the app built into the TV is the only way you're going to be able to watch a 4K stream uh, right. or, or, or high dynamic range currently, like with Amazon's instant video service, only yep. on select Samsung TVs and now some LG TVs. Uh, those are your, you're locked into the app that's actually built into the TV. And then it becomes more important about how you then deal with the audio issue or something like that. However, mm -hmm. uh, also uh, Nvidia shield also offers 4k Netflix and, and, and YouTube, I believe. And that is one of the few, we were mentioning this, one of the few external boxes that you can have to enjoy a 4k streaming experience. So, right. Uh, but it is another that, box. Without a doubt. Yeah. Um, speaking of software, I wanted to get a sense of you. You mentioned er, earlier, you know, depending on which media center software you select. Uh, tell us a little bit about what the choices are there. Well, as far as the actual media well, center software itself? Yeah, or? yeah exactly. Because now that we don't have Windows Media Center on Windows 10, I mean, if you have a Windows 7 oh, that's or 8. True. You'll still have it, but if you have Windows 10 or if you want to go off of Windows and into Linux or Mac, uh, you know, what are some of the options for providing sort of the, the media center experience from the PC? 
Well, I think the big ones right now that a lot of people the, the hub, uh, go to at least first or initially to check out are things like Kodi, K-O-D-I, uh, Kodi.tv. That's a, I want to say a spinoff of XNBC, which was a, a media center style product developed. Yeah, uh, that right there, that provides your, your 10 foot interface, uh, a front end for your, your, your tuner software choices in addition to being able to place that will play all of your content on uh, through one interface. So mm. it, it has the codec support. It can integrate with your with your DVR and TV tuner choice and and to be able to provide things like, you know, maybe external access like, oh, I'm outside of the home. How the hell do I actually can I enjoy that content while I'm on the road? And I'll, that's another I'll thing. Sling. Totally. Or, or like I mentioned, Tableau TV earlier, their, their DVR product is specifically made for that. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's nice. Or you think too of, yeah, you mentioned Sling, but I'm also thinking of the, not just Sling TV, but the Sling hardware, which actually plugs into a set top box and mm -hmm. then will stream that content to a mobile device or whatever as well. Uh, right. but that, uh, there was, we mentioned Cody and Plex in particular, and I'm trying to think if there's others as well. I'm, there are probably many options out there. So it, it, it's finding what has the right support uh, for what it is you're trying to do and to keep it as simple as possible so it's headache free. It's good if there's a great user community as well that's involved because if you run into an issue, chances are you're, you're never the first person to have that problem, hopefully. Right. And then you'll be able to immediately go on and get support for things like that. However, mm -hmm. if if you're looking at cable box replacement, and unfortunately, I don't, I'm not aware of anything for satellite TV users in terms of being able to swap out that for a, a build your own style box. But uh, I would say stick with Windows Seven because specifically one of the changes, and I don't know if they ever fixed this or not with Windows Eight One, but Windows Seven with Windows Media Center allowed you to boot directly into Media Center. Uh, so even if the system restarted or did an update or whatever, you would never see Windows. It would just immediately go into that that ten foot UI and give you that that, that interface without without a lot of hassle. So mm. uh, it was an easy thing to configure, and and it just worked with cable card tuners. But like I said too, if you're doing it all over the air and with streaming services uh, for to fill in the blanks. Uh, your options are much greater and you'll be able to pick and choose basically what software packages you like, what what interface, how you want that interface to look and to customize it to your heart's content. So, yeah, cool. So Kyle Ray Jr. in the chat room is asking, what do you think of uh, purpose built boxes, dedicated boxes like popcorn or Dune HD? I've used those and they are good. It's just the long-term viability. Uh, as long as as long as they remain well supported over the years, because I, I hate to buy something and then two years later I've got to just it uh, it stops working or it's no longer functional, something like that. So it comes down to for TV tuning, it's all about guide data, guide data and the interface overall. Because once you build a system, uh, as long as you're not constantly installing and uninstalling software, you just kind of leave it alone. It's functioning. It, as long as the guide data gets updated and it records and nothing breaks, it's going to work <laughs> quite well for a long time. Uh, case in point, my own my own home theater PC, that thing just, it's a Windows box that surprisingly is incredibly stable because it doesn't do anything else other than record TV shows and stream video around the home. So, Right. But I've, I've used, I want to say I've used Popcorn Hour and I've used a few Popcorn Hour, that's what it's well. called, yeah. And... I found them to be terrific products with with good user communities, at least back when I looked at them. It's been a couple of years now. So um, that'll be the next thing to check out. I I am really just kind of getting excited, at least for the over-the-air side of things, is being able to record a couple of shows at once, multiple tuners for that environment. The one thing I'm a little disappointed about, and I need to understand why, and I'm going to ping some of the manufacturers, but most of the new TVs I look at uh, this year and last year featured good channel guides built into every TV, every HD TV and 4k TV has a built in over the air tuner. Most of them have hidden in there somewhere DVR recording capabilities, but they're not allowed to expose it here in North America for some reason. So wow, they give you, they, give, weird. they tease you with a record button, but you hit it and it's like unavailable. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, so, and there is absolutely no reason they couldn't then say, Oh, here's a DVR app or, or use third party apps, you know, have, have folks like, Cody and Plex and those create 
create an interface that could be or an app for that specific platform that you could then load up, plug in a plug in a thumb drive for storage or whatever, an external hard drive, and then have that just as a built in DVR right there on the TV itself. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no nice? reason they can't. Yeah, there's no reason they can't do it. It's just uh, is it worth their time? I think is really what it comes down to or or there's some legal issue where they get into spitting matches over, you know, can I do this on this one? Case in point, the recent lawsuits that TiVo has been flinging out to various companies, uh, namely Samsung, that were just popping up in the news this week uh, mm -hmm. regarding, oh, who knows? I don't know. TiVo suing somebody. It, basically, if you have a fast forward or play and a rewind button with a digitizer and, and hardware storage all in one platform, basically they have every patent related to any combination of those things. So... If you're if you're trying to create your own DVR nowadays, you're going to have to run the TiVo gauntlet to get it out there. So, yeah, just to reiterate, and speaking of DVR, Sandblaster is asking with Windows 10, how do you record over the air TV channels? Do do you do you do the Seton or Silicon Dust products do that for you? And I think the answer is yes. Right. I mean, you have to set it yeah. up, but that's what you need. Totally. Or or go with something like Cody and find whatever, you know, back end you want to use as far as the recording capabilities go. It'll it'll integrate that as well. Um, you, over the years, just a lot easier. There's a lot more options in terms of just how to to record and save that. It's when you're dealing with encrypted cable content that things become trickier. And also, mm -hmm. too, if, if you are planning on building a cable box, uh, do it yourself with a cable card tuner. There are some limitations specifically. If you're into watching on demand anything, uh, you're going to lose that functionality, be it be it the streamed video services uh, from your provider or something like pay-per-view. Uh, so if that's a big part of your life, you know, maybe maybe ditching that cable box isn't such a good idea for you personally. <laughs> it, so in, it's in just fact, something to keep in mind. In fact, Mike Heiss in the chat room is asking exactly this, our friend Mike. Uh, what do you see as the workaround for features available via fa cable card that are currently captive to the to the cable provider, the MSO uh, supplied set top boxes? And you're saying there may not be like, for example, video on demand or pay-per-view. Yeah, I'll be honest with you. I've been a long time Netflix subscriber. I, I, I find there's always something on there for me to watch. And if it's not Netflix, uh, you know, I can always go to Hulu or Hulu Plus. And they also have a lot of the content that I might have wanted to stream uh, uh, similar. It might not be the exact show. Also, too, again, I, if it comes right down to it, check the websites. A lot of shows will offer a limited viewing window for like maybe the first five days or something of where you can then stream that content for free. Uh, mm. That's always something to take a look at on whoever the whoever the providers or the content owners website is. I'm, I'm, I'm constantly surprised at what's being offered now for for affordable or even free streaming options. Um, yeah. It's just something good to check out. And uh, it, it's it's the way to go. Um, I'm trying to think of you know, something else. Too. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, while you're thinking of that, uh, I just I just realized there's Hulu and there's Hulu Plus, which you just mentioned. Hulu, the regular, the free one, you can access from a PC, but you can't from a set-top box that might have a Hulu. There, there is no Hulu app in a Roku box or a TV for the free version, only Hulu Plus. But if you have a home theater PC, you could access the free Hulu site. And I don't know if that gives you everything that Hulu Plus does by paying for it. Uh, but it does give you that option, which you don't otherwise have if you don't have a PC in your home theater. I totally agree with that. It, mm -hmm. I, it gives you more, and because it's an NBC Universal product too, there, there is the, the great library of content you'll have available in terms of what they offer. But um, if you've already slashed the bill for paying a monthly service fee for either cable or satellite, Hulu, especially the commercial free version, uh, looks to be worth the extra bucks for that. that that's one of oh, those things that really, really replace a lot of your content. Uh, a friend of mine, she's currently in an apartment with great bandwidth, uh, using an over-the-air tuner uh, along with Sling TV, the $20 a month service. Plus, I think she does one extra package for, uh, I want to say, news programs or something. She's a teacher. Uh, mm -hmm. And on top of that, uh, that covers her basic needs. And, and, and she also has an Apple TV with a few apps on there as well. That's another platform I really like a lot. And 
people were bemoaning, uh, some were bemoaning at least, that the latest, the latest iteration of the new Apple TV that was announced yesterday uh, seems to, I don't know, it, it, it's not 4K, and it, it adds a few interesting control features, specifically with Siri and voice control and things like that. But And that new remote looks pretty slick, but otherwise... <laughs> It it's seemed not very all that I don't exciting. Know. Yeah, other than I just like it as a platform. It's but there are also you know if, if you're a if you're a uh, a Roku user, uh, you already you're already kind of laughing at the whole scenario. It's like oh you know what we got <laughs> we have great hardware with awesome wireless remotes, and it's like and you can talk the damn remote. Just you, we've had all this already. So yeah, it's right, like, right. <laughs> <laughs> Hulu you, <laughs> or Hulu, uh, the Roku users are like Psh, <laughs> we've got yeah. it. So. Old school, man. <clears throat> okay, well, listen, before we before we continue, I'd like to thank uh, the other ep uh, sponsor for our episode today, which is ProXPN. Uh, ProXPN is a global VPN or virtual private network that works with almost any internet connection, provides a secure encrypted tunnel through which all of your online data passes back and forth. Any online application can work with ProXPN, including your web browser, email, file sharing, and instant messaging programs. ProXPN keeps everything you do online hidden from prying eyes, disguising your physical location and giving you unfettered access to any website or online service, no matter where you live or travel to. ProXPN does zero logging. That's right. Unlike other VPNs, ProXPN keeps no record of your online activity. And you get complete privacy through a 512-bit encryption tunnel and a 2048-bit encryption key. And it works with OpenVPN or PPTP. You get to choose. No IPv6 traffic leakage or DNS hijacking. ProXPN is fully protected and up to date. You can protect yourself against your ISP's six strikes rule, monitoring and throttling, and bypass internet filtering and blocked websites. You can also bypass geographical restrictions for internet content and online video with worldwide servers in the U.S., U.K., Asia, and more. And now ProXPN has more servers and improved speeds than ever before. ProXPN's software for Windows and Mac offers advanced controls. You can select ports, connect at startup, and even select which program should be shut down if your anonymous connection is ever interrupted. ProXPN also works with your iOS or Android device, allowing you to use your data plan or public or corporate Wi-Fi with complete and total privacy on the go. Hey, even our own Steve Gibson gave it a great review on Security Now. So go to ProXPN.com slash twit for more information and to sign up. ProXPN premium accounts are normally $9.98 a month, but we've got a special offer. If you use the code HTG50 at checkout, you'll receive 50% off the monthly price when you sign up for a 12-month subscription. That's less than 5 bucks a month when you sign up for a year, and it's good for the lifetime of your account. If you're not satisfied, you can cancel within 7 days for a full refund. So go to ProXPN.com twit and sign up with the code HTG50. ProXPN accepts payment through Visa, PayPal, and even Bitcoin. We thank ProXPN very much for their support of Home Theater Geeks. So we got a few minutes left here, and uh, I want to make sure I get through some of the things that uh, I had in mind here, one of which was Raspberry Pi. We were talking about this uh, off before the show actually officially started. What is your feeling about using a Raspberry Pi as a home theater PC? As long as it has the horsepower to do what you need, I, I, I'd be hesitant to use a first generation Raspberry Pi unless it was for a single person user situation uh, where you're dealing with maybe a couple simultaneous recordings or things like that. However, if you're using, you're going to be using network tuners anyway, unless you're saving directly to this, where are you going to do the storage at? Well, you could do it on the device or to say a NAS or an external hard drive or something like that. It, it should work, and it should work pretty well, and that's it's great in the sense that it's super low power, which if there's one thing when I'm building these systems, uh, spe specifically home theater PCs, it's that I want the power consumption to be as low as possible, yet still provide the performance for multiple recording, simultaneous recordings and or multiple simultaneous outstreams going to whatever devices I need. 
yet at the same point, I know this device is going to be running almost 24 seven for years on end. And I, I don't want it to be just, you know, it doesn't need to be an 800 watt, you know, gaming box. Uh, although it's nice if it can ha jump up to that when needed or requested on the big screen. But still, <laughs> uh, en energy efficiency is one of the things I think about a lot. And a, a device like the Raspberry Pi is ridiculously low power. So it, it and the version two product is has even more horsepower and it should be able to create a pretty good experience. And I am sure and this is something I haven't actually looked up yet, but there, there are already projects out there for doing DVRs on the Raspberry Pi, as we've talked about a couple. But um, I, I bet you that's a well-supported community where you can really get into it and create, you know, a lightweight device that you could literally stick on the back of a TV, run a network cable into it, and and enjoy a great DVR experience. I'm sure. And mm -hmm. you know what? I I have a I have an original Raspberry Pi that it's currently sitting in a test bag. I have and. I have no reason not to try it with that because the beauty of Raspberry Pi is that you can set them up. You set up the whole operating system and everything on a on a um, on an SD memory card. So just by I currently have one project on there. I'll pop that out, put in another one with some DVR software, and I'll give that a shot because I also I also have plenty of network tuners and other devices like that as well. So it should be doable. However, when I experimented with Atom hardware, uh, Intel Atom. Uh, on mm -hmm. an integrated board with the graphic side of it was okay, but I found that under intense use, it, it just would slow down here and there enough to where it became quite annoying. And of course, going to an ultra energy, ultra low power Sandy Bridge chip back in the day, uh, that changed everything. That was suddenly like I have plenty of horsepower under the hood, and yet I can still run it at like 30 watts total uh, mm -hmm. uh, and under general use. So. Those were all things I kept in mind when I was doing it. But there shouldn't be any reason you couldn't use a Raspberry Pi to do it. It's just to, depending on the size of the household you're talking about, how much content you're looking to record, and and what your tuner hardware is. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you've got everything I just listed, give it a shot because I'm sure the community is 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 ripe uh, with with users who who've got great setups to try. And because of the way you load up software on a Raspberry Pi, it's relatively easy to use and and it's affordable. That's the other big thing, too. Compared to something like an Intel Nook, you can get a Raspberry Pi with a case to put it in for, you know, 30 bucks or 40 bucks. <laughs> maybe. So, and, and Intel also has their new sticks as well. The i7 stick is just out or their their uh, their new chipset. God, I can't think of it now. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, I can't either. It? Skylake. Oh, okay, I think right. it is. And, uh, yeah, Good sound so, in the chat room is mentioning the Intel stick PCs, and I was going to pass that along. What do you think? I, it, again, that's that has probably more hardware than most sticks out there. I'm sure it does. Intel likes to show off that way. So it, it goes back to that compute power scenario again. I've, I've messed with a lot of stick devices that were, you know, early Android based ones, and they never they all felt underpowered. And that was something where. I, when when I'm in the home theater environment, the last thing I want to do is hit a button and not have an instant response. I, mm -hmm. I don't I don't even want to. That just takes me out of it, and it becomes less enjoyable to use. So you hit a certain level, and having something like either a dual core or a, a well multi threaded process or something that can handle lots of simultaneous things going on, so that you're not interrupting your recording in any way, uh, while you know being able to play back all the things you need to especially in a busy household, that's where it becomes more important, I think, to have adequate CPU power and, and network performance as well. I mean, mm -hmm. it, things like wired gigabit is not a big deal anymore. Uh, everyone can have that. Uh, and even wireless Giga, technologies Giga, have gotten Giga, Gigabit Ethernet you're talking about. where, you, where Yeah, and it's, doing, and it's yeah. not necessarily a requirement, but, you know, it, just keep in mind that hardwiring things generally, if you're dealing with home networking, uh, is going to be a lot more reliable than most Wi-Fi. Although I found that the AC hardware of late for Wi-Fi uh, seems to do a pretty good job overall. Although I, I'm still I still go for a switch and an Ethernet cable any day compared to most yeah. Wi-Fi setups. So, unless, yeah, you know. I'm afraid I do too. No, I do too. Uh, 802 802.11 AC is the most recent and probably most reliable Wi-Fi. But as you say. Uh, in my opinion, certainly for media streaming like this, uh, uh, I'll take a cable any day. Without a doubt. I mean, yeah. also think too with uh, when you start getting into high quality as well, uh, that's where 
with 4K streaming or whatever, or even yep. with you think you think about the data rates on an HDMI cable, uh, it requires a lot of bits to be moving around. And if you're if you're trying to pull down a lot of data, um, say for multiple 4K streams in a household, you need a good internet connection for that. But then you need adequate distribution to all the products in the home. So yep. regardless yep. of how you do, my current setup in the room I'm sitting in right now is actually doing everything over power line, which is I, really? you know if, if if that works for you, it is super convenient. Uh, we needed we needed Ethernet out to the living room uh, to put into the AVR and other products out there, and it was way easier just to grab a couple of adapters, plug one in near where the router hardware is, kind of centrally located in the home, and then at e at the endpoints of the house, we have adapters, matching adapters that go in to provide the output for. They have those two gigabit wow. speeds now as well, and That's including amazing. some really really cool ones too that'll do like multi port. So you have like the main you have the input basically or the the main port that that plugs in near the router and then at the ends you can have things like four or five port switches uh that are built into the receiver hardware and transceiver i guess technically but still yeah, yeah. Uh, don't don't knock the power line uh networking stuff it <laughs> works really well you know works really well that, and i've got a mix of old and new products that are all adhering to the main standard and they all mm -hmm. seem to play really well with each other so that's amazing to me i've i've heard the uh metaphor often that uh, power line networking is like driving a Ferrari on a dirt road. You know that you've got all <laughs> this very, <laughs> you've got all this really fine detailed data. You know, going very fast over this really loud, so to speak, uh, noisy power. You know, it's going along the same distribution channel as the as the power in your house. And I'm amazed it works as well as it does. I am too. And for people concerned maybe about security or things like that as well, at least the units I'm looking at, they all enable by default AES encryption for the data mm. uh, from product to product. So once they're once they're linked to each other and synced up, um, it, it should be a fairly secure way to move the data around. I'm thinking maybe if there was some way, I doubt your neighbors could pick up on it or something like that. But um, yeah, it's just, it's another good thing if you're having Wi-Fi issues within the home. Consider Powerline. Uh, it, it is it is a good alternative for for your home theater needs and for just general. Like right now, this connection is traveling over parts of the infrastructure of the power in this house. So. <laughs> wow, that's it, amazing. It, it seems to work pretty well. I do find yeah. it does at least the setup I have. I'm using some pretty value oriented uh, Powerline hardware. I'm I'm getting about half the throughput of the overall bandwidth available on our mm -hmm. on our internet connection, but. We have like over a hundred megabit to this this home I'm in right now, and and I get maybe half that to the power line adapters, which is still plenty. And the latency yeah. is excellent. So that's the other thing too. If you're a gamer or something like that, um, I, don't, I don't have any issues with any of that. And I'm, I'm streaming 4K to the, the TV. I'm I'm online. I'm using BitTorrent. I'm doing everything, and uh, I use a lot of data. So I yeah, take advantage. Yeah. Of it. <laughs> Interesting. Compi386 in the chat room is doing the same thing. Power line network backbone across the building, Wi-Fi access points, and wired switches, um, oh. which which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, I actually Tyson, run a five-port switch right out of the power line Ethernet adapter in, in this room uh, mm -hmm. to a switch, and then everything's wired to that. And I've got a beautiful. game console, computer, TV, blah, blah, blah. You know, have, you ever, it, have you ever used Mocha? Uh, over over um, coax, Mike Heiss in the chat room is is mentioning that that's another alternative. If you have coax cabling running throughout your house as well, that's something we needed to do a very long run of networking, and it turned out it went beyond the spec that's advisable for Cat five or Cat six, uh, and uh, like we're talking several hundred yards, and we ended up finding a product. Uh, and I don't have the product name right in front of me, but we were able to push over coax up to, I want to say, one or two kilometers uh, with basically adapters on each end, gigabit speed. And, and wow. those things exist and they're out there. And I'm also looking at products like uh, 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 HD Base T in particular as well for right, not right, only right. video distribution, which now they're they're getting into the 4K space. That might be the new big one, really, in terms of where I'm looking for data and and video streaming services around the home and mm -hmm. or over existing networking infrastructure. And that to me is some of the most exciting developments I've seen. And and quality hardware. None of it's really cheap, but it seems to be well established and it works. 
So that, I hate I hate buying stuff where you got to fiddle with it constantly. So that's one of the mm. one of the areas I look for uh, good, reliable products. Yeah. Yeah. What about HDMI outputs? Uh, do do PCs generally have them or not? And if not, I guess you'd have to either install a card or uh, use a, a USB to HD, uh, HDMI or Thunderbolt to HDMI kind of interface. What's what's the best HDMI solution? Because you ultimately need to get HDMI going to the TV or your AV receiver, your home theater system. Totally. Uh most PCs nowadays will have HDMI or okay. they'll have dis DisplayPort. And DisplayPort, most of the DisplayPort adapters on most hardware you'll find is adaptable to HDMI. You can't go the other way around due to the, the data structure or the data type that the, mm -hmm. that's being converted. But uh, that's there. And through my own home theater PC with the right software, the playback software in particular is the, the big one. I'm able to do things like lossless audio with Blu-ray playback uh, streamed mm -hmm. to to my AVR uh, over that HDMI connection. And it is like I see the Dolby True HD or DTS HD Master Audio light up on the receiver. So I know so it's, it's getting there. It. And, yeah, and yeah, yeah, it's it's glorious sound quality. Uh, in addition, oh. yeah, but HDMI has been around for a while now. And the latest generation of hardware is supporting uh, HDMI 2.0. So you'll get 4K support. I'm not seeing anything as far as, you know, HDCP, as far as protected content support uh, yet. But that we're, that's really early on for that. And there may yeah. be other issues I'm, I'm kind of ignoring. Also, too, <laughs> if you need to extend uh, HDMI over a length as well. We were talking about networking overall, but I've also used HDMI to CAT network uh, adapters as well. And they mm -hmm. generally work really, really well. So if you have oh, to do yeah. a super you, you long can run, run those long, long distances as well. Totally. Lots of good options. My, Mike Heiss in the chat room is saying HD base T will need fiber for 4K. Uh, it not that won't work very well on a category five or category six cable, copper, that is. Good to know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, well, listen, <laughs> the, the hour has flown past. Good golly. <laughs> <laughs> can you can you believe it? I mean, it's like what? <laughs> like this whole year oh. is flying by, but this whole hour just flew right by. So uh, uh, I want to thank you so much for being here again for part two of our discussion focused on home theater PCs. Tons of great information. Uh, I want to thank you so much for being here, Robert Heron uh, at HeronFidelity.com. Be sure and go check it out. Thanks so much. Thank you. And if I can leave everyone with the last message, it's just basically if, if you've been thinking about building some hardware repurpose an old system you have right now to experiment with and try try different software packages try different operating great. systems uh, great idea there, some of the some of the tuner hardware we've talked about this hour is solid it'll work with many platforms and check out their forums uh specific to the hardware you're looking at in terms of getting ideas for what software packages to try or what works best in this scenario uh, there are many people out there experimenting with it, and it's just a uh, it, there's a wealth of information out there to to take and to run with. Yeah, especially a bunch of information on avsforum.com where I work. So uh, be sure to check the that out. The granddaddy of all websites. I, <laughs> that, <laughs> it really is. Yep, absolutely. Uh, so for more on on Robert's work in particular, be sure to go to heronfidelity.com. You can always find me, of course, at avsforum.com. Uh, where you can find lots of information about home theater PC from people who are actually getting their hands dirty with it. Uh, you can email me at scott at twit.tv and you can follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott and at avsforum. You can always find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks right here at twit.tv slash htg and on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash twit home theater geeks. Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be Ralph Potts, the Blu-ray reviewer on AVS. We're going to be talking all about Blu-rays and uh, what are the best ones out there, what might be the ones to avoid, which ones have the best soundtrack, the uh, best video. One of the great things that Ralph does on AVS is, in addition to reviewing the movie itself, he spends a lot of time evaluating the audio and video quality on the disc. And believe me, it's not uniformly great. So uh, we should have a great time talking about that uh, next week, and I do hope you will join us for that. Until then, geek out.